already been mentioned but the next slide shows this list medical uh, four out of five of these use high field electromagnets uh, obviously magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy which has been discussed earlier particle accelerators which have not really been discussed very much here but uh, have in fact uh, developed a whole uh, range of superconducting technology magnetic separators for ore processing which are actually in use in uh, in certain plants and a host of special magnets and uh, R&D magnets which are very important for scientific research and are used in most modern research facilities uh, the resonant cavities is the only one that doesn't involve high magnetic fields and I'll come back to that if time allows I've already written down five important, quite successful, dem I've also written down five important uh, demonstration, successful demonstration projects which have not made it into general use. These are shown in the next slide. Once again, four out of five of these are high field magnets. Uh, the AC transmission requires supercurrent, but not a high magnetic field. But the AC synchronous generator, the levitated train, the coupling of superconductivity with MHD and fusion, fusion all use magnet technology. Obviously, in several of these, the superconductivity is a necessary but not sufficient technology for total success. But at least we have given a boost to these other technologies. Now, I mentioned the handicap of helium refrigeration. But as you all know, the discovery of high temperature superconductors offers an opportunity to work close to 100 degrees Kelvin using liquid nitrogen as a refrigerant. If you look, uh, you, you've seen this slide before. I'm going to show you the, what happened to the transition temperature. Uh, as we look over that historical slide, you see starting out from mercury, where I started, going through the type two superconductors which led to high field magnets. Finally, we have a sudden jump of a factor four or five in critical temperature, which is absolutely amazing from any point of view. Uh, I think uh, we may need to rename these uh, new HTSC superconductors. Uh, they probably will have type two properties, but perhaps we should call them type three. They seem to be radically different in, uh, in properties. One of the interesting things about them, and I think is relevant to the technology, is the fact that you can replace, in the yttrium barium copper oxide, you can replace the yttrium by almost any one of the rare earths, as shown in the next slide, which is a slide, I believe, from publication by uh, Belcor. And uh, you see that while the normal state resistivities vary enormously between uh, these various uh, rare earths, neodymium, samarium, europium, erbium, dysprosium, and so forth, I won't read them all, the actual critical temperature of the superconducting material is close to the uh, same point. A very interesting phenomenon. I understand that, uh, well, I, I think this gives us some flexibility in the technology because we're not restricted to one single compound. Uh, I understand that the Chinese have already successfully made a high TC superconductor using mish metal, which is a mixture of rare, rare earths, which is found in the ground in in China, I gather in abundance. These new superconductors offer an amazingly high critical magnetic field, as shown in the next slide. These, are, these data are a combination of, of, uh, of data from several, several different sources, but and the exact upper critical field of these materials is not known. It's probably in excess of what I've shown here, although talking to some Russian friends on a recent trip to the Soviet Union, they said they thought it was slightly less. But it depends on what you define as the transition in these materials. The, uh, so there's uh, some technical problems. But at any rate, what is very dramatic is that not only do we have a high critical temperature, but we have the highest critical magnetic field that's ever been known. This conjures up the possibility of constructing much more powerful magnets than heretofore. We must remember, however, that if we could build a 100 Tesla magnet, the inner windings would be subjected to forces exceeding the strength of the materials due to the enormous Lorentz magnetic pressure that would occur. I think it would be a very challenging national project to use these new HTSC materials to build the inner coils of a magnet aimed at cracking the Gauss barrier 
and reaching maybe fields of 30 in the region of 30 to 50 Tesla, which I, I think is probably technically feasible. Well, let's get a, a li another look at the, at the, uh, the basic uh, structure of a magnet, what is, in, what is involved. The next slide, please. You have a coil of superconducting wire, shown here as a simple solenoid, immersed or in contact with a cryogenic fluid, which is contained in an insulating vessel, sometimes called a Dewar vessel, or more commonly a cryostat. Of course, there's a great variety of shapes of the windings. Frequently, one has two separate windings to form a dipole, for example, in accelerator magnets. The windings may be saddle-shaped or formed into the shape of a racetrack or many other different shapes, but the general principles are the same. Now, if we could replace the liquid helium by liquid nitrogen, several advantages would accrue. Next slide, please. The refrigerator would be cheaper and simpler. Most big systems will need a refrigerator, although it is possible to truck in the fluid. This would yield greater reliability. Nitrogen is readily available from the atmosphere and is a very cheap compared to helium. And the problems with structural and support materials and the amount of uh, insulation and so forth are greatly relaxed. Needless to say, of course, as everyone has said, if we had room temperature superconductors, the cryogenic system would be eliminated, which would simplify things even more. But as regards the magnet itself, it must be constructed from cost-competitive materials and it must meet an engineering specification. That little statement at the bottom of the slide is sort of the hooker in the whole thing. The most serious specification after temperature and magnetic field that the material must, re must uh, uh, meet is that the critical current. And I haven't defined that previously, but what one finds with these materials is it's a, there is a current which you pass through the windings of the magnet, which if it exceeds, reaches a certain critical value, the conductor normalizes, and that means usually that the magnet loses its magnetic field. Uh, the critical current is an independent parameter from field, magnetic field, and temperature, to a large degree. If we divide the critical current of the conductor by the cross-sectional area of the superconducting part of the conductor, we get the critical current density, of the material. For the materials we're very familiar with now, um, such as niobium titanium and um, niobium 310, uh, the critical current density usually lies somewhere between 100,000 and a million amperes per square centimeter. And just, you can, most of you know what a centimeter look li looks like, but if, if you just think of the end of my uh, uh, nail, the nail on my first finger, pushing a million amperes through a conductor in a small area like that is truly impressive. You cannot do that with copper unless you go to mo most elaborate cooling, high-speed cooling. In fact, uh, you really need a river like the Charles River to achieve the kind of cooling you need to, to get that kind of density in a normal conductor. And in fact, the operating densities in most power equipment are something around more like 1,000 amps per square centimeter, not a million. So really, this is one of the crucial properties that these high-field superconductors have, the critical current density. You can draw a surface which def define the three parameters, temperature, magnetic field, and critical current density. I've got that in the next slide. The outer surface, the yellow one, is actually for material that's never really been used in practice, uh, niobium-3 germanium. Below that is a, another onion skin for niobium-3 tin, and, and the deepest one is niobium titanium. And let me just tell you what's on the, on the three axes. Just take the niobium germanium. It goes, the critical field is 400 kilogauss. That's at absolute zero, essentially. And the uh, 400 kilogauss is about 40 Tesla. The transition temperature, which you see over this side, is just over 20 degrees Kelvin. And the uh, current density is between 10 to the, 10 to the 6 
just over 10 to the 6 amps per square centimeter, over a million. That's a very good conductor material. Now, I'm titanium, the inner slice is not as good a conductor, but it will carry over 100,000 amperes per square centimeter. But it's very good from a metallurgical and conductor handling point of view because it is ductile and can be drawn very readily. Now, I need to tell you something else about this. The, what makes the critical de current density what it is? It turns out to be very highly dependent on the defects in the material. And this comes about in the following ways. The next slide will show. In these materials at high magnetic field, there is a penetration of flux into the material. There are a large number of fluxoids, as we call them, which pass through the interior of the superconductor. But there are superconducting regions between these fluxoids, shown by the little circles you see there, which are still superconducting and will carry an electric current with zero. Um, the current tends to drive the fluxoids out, and uh, this causes the current to be very, the current density to be very, very low. However, if you put in defects which vary from material to material, the kinds of defects that work, you can pin these fluxoids. I've shown defects in the lower block, and you see those um, that network. It could be anything you want: dislocations, grain boundaries. Uh, each one has certain, uh, different uh, effects in different materials, but. In, for example, in the case of niobium titanium, it turns out that combination of precipitates and uh, uh, dislocations are uh, efficacious. But at any rate, you put in the maximum amount of defect for the specific material and you get these very high current densities. If you don't do that in processing, then you don't get them. Now, nature is sometimes good to us and makes this happen spontaneously. It happens spontaneously more or less in niobium 310 where the defects are essentially uh, lattice vacancies, and the first time anybody made Niobium 310 as a high field superconductor, they got a high critical current density. This was very fortuitous because it was part of the 1960 discovery. Now, we've made some measurements in a preliminary way on the ceramic materials based on the 1, 2, 3 compounds, the new high temperature superconductors. And unfortunately, nature hasn't been good to us so far. The pinning is not very good in the natural state. Our preliminary data indicate that the, the current density is somewhere around 10,000 amps per square centimeter, quite a lot, but not, um, not very high compared with the others. And it drops down to somewhere below 1,000 amps per square centimeter at 70, 70. Uh, the the 10,000 figure was, for, sorry, I, I didn't say it was for 4 degrees Kelvin. The... Um, the uh, current density is less than 1,000 amps per square centimeter at um, 77 degrees Kelvin. In other words, we're about a factor 100 down from the performance of the other superconductors. This may be acceptable for a transmission line, but is marginal for magnets. Part of the difficulty seems to stem from an anisotropy effect in the material. Some early single crystal data seem to indicate that the critical current density is a function of crystal orientation as shown in the next slide. What I try to indicate here is that if the current is in the AB plane of the crystal, this is an orthorhombic crystal with a high asymmetry of, uh, ax of uh, uh, actual length of uh, if the current is in the AB plane, you have a high JC, and if it's in the AC or the BC plane, then you have a low JC by a factor of 20, seems to be somewhere around the ballpark. The result of this is when you make a polycrystalline ceramic, as you see below, you'll have a mixture of good cr critical current density and lower critical current density, depending on the orientation of the grains. Well, naturally, when, since these things are in series, the grain orientation, the lower critical current density will dominate, and that seems to be one of the factors. Now, we don't know why, though, the, the thing drops off with increasing temperature. There is a tendency to, for that to, to happen to some degree in uh, the old type two superconductors, but in this case, it seems to be steeper than we would expect, the variation with temperature. 
And what it really amounts to is we don't understand the pinning mechanism. We don't know what's pinning vortices in these grains and in the single crystals. If the anisotropy proves to be intractable, it may be necessary to try to produce conductors in which individual grains are artificially oriented in preferred directions, somewhat analogous to grain-oriented magnetic sheet used in transformers. Possibly we may need to produce even single crystal filaments for these conductors. I regard both of these concepts as exciting challenges for the materials engineer, and we're going to need some major inventions to make this happen. Also, and other people have pointed this out, all of this ignores the basically brittle mixture, uh, nature of the ceramic material, which poses ma major problem in making windable conductors. Of course, in any case, these will have to be fabricated with normal metal shunts or stabilizers, so there is a scope for innovative composite reinforcement of the ceramic. John Rowell mentioned the chemical problems, the same kind of problems with oxygen uh, loss discussed for thin films could be equally applicable, could be a problem in processing of the bulk conductors. I'd like to mention one other, before I close, one other troublesome effect with these ceramics that we've noted, noted by many investigators. Next slide, please. The ceramic specimens tested to date appear to show intergranular effects known as weak links. What this is, amounts to is that at quite small magnetic fields or applied currents, material between the grains develops resistance. Not a very high resistance, but a low level, which will pass quite high currents, but show some intrinsic loss in the material. No, in other words, it's not a true superconductor. It may be possible to eliminate this effect by new techniques of preparation, but I don't know of anyone that's really succeeded in doing that. I know of people who have made improvements, but we haven't gotten rid of it totally. I've said nothing about the multifilamentary nature about of conventional uh, magnet conductors that are um, used today. So it, it may be possible, to, it may be required in some cases, certainly in low, in AC situations where AC losses are important, to build some kind of superconductor filaments into, into the, the conductors. I wanted to uh, say a couple of other things that uh, relate to non-magnetic non applications. I'll just mention them in passing. If I could have the next slide, please. Oh, this was a, an indication of the filaments um, in the conventional conductors used today. The superconductors are broken up into many, many, many fine filaments. I don't think this will be as critical in the case of the high temperature materials because of the greater, uh, st the greater stability to heat absorption at the higher temperatures. So it may be used to, possible to work with much larger diameter filaments than in the case of the Nyman titanium or Nyman 310. Next slide, please. This shows you a resonant cavity used uh, in a linear accelerator. This is a very important technology, presently mostly used in high energy physics. Uh, one sees it as an, a, a growing importance to the generation of high frequency waves and also the microwaves and also the um, free electron laser. And uh, if we could uh, get this, these uh, cavities, in st they're presently made out of niobium. It's the only material we know how to make a low loss high frequency cavity out of that's satisfactory. We would like to develop the new high temperature superconductors for the use in these cavities and it would make a dramatic difference to the economics and it would impact a whole bunch of other technologies for example, a free electron laser. The other area is the transmission line, which I mentioned does not use magnetic, high magnetic fields. Next slide. Here's a picture of the Brookhaven line, which was built several years ago. Very successful demonstration project, not adopted by the utility industry. 138 kilovolts, 4,100 amperes. It uses a cable. Next slide in which an iron 310 conductor with stabilizers is wound into the inner and outer of a high-voltage cable. 
This is a tape application. And I think that probably the easiest thing to make out of the new high temperature superconductors in the near term are tapes. Some people are already attempting that and I think we'll probably see some fairly reasonable high current conductors in, in the fairly near future. There's a great deal, as I said out, I said at the beginning, my message to you is that the first phase of this, the next three or four years, is material science and engineering. We've got to get good conductors with a variety of, of missions for the particular applications that they'll be used in. But as right now, the field is very wide open. There's a great scope for innovation, great scope for a lot of inventions, material science and engineering. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there you have it, the uh, a range of technological challenges that will enable us to translate scientific discovery into commercial products. A big challenge, but I know one that we can face up to and can meet. Thank you very much. final session for this morning is on technology transfer. This is an item which certainly can't be treated adequately in one half hour. Uh, whole conferences are held on the subject of technology transfer, but it is also an item that can't be ignored. And you will notice that a couple of the workshop sessions this afternoon will most certainly deal with the issue, uh, in particular workshops two and five. We have with us today two speakers. Uh, to address some aspects of the issue of technology transfer and how the federal government is approaching it. Basically, the problem is how do we get the research results which uh, we are getting from the, the federal laboratories into industry? How can we make that transition as smooth and as quick as possible? Obviously, it is not going to work well unless technology transfer is part of the initial planning process for any research project. Uh, if you think about why the government is doing research, uh, it's quite clear that this has to be the case in order for it to be successful. The non-defense R&D, which is conducted by the federal government or funded through contractors by the federal government, has as its only reason for existence eventual transfer of the technology to the private sector. And uh, I, I know that some of you will probably observe quite correctly that this has not always been the apparent major uh, motive behind some of the work that's done, but it's something that we are conscious of and something that we are trying to improve greatly. The consideration of how the technology will be transferred must be a priority item throughout all stages of R&D. Uh, we also know that we have to address some of the legal, administrative, and economic issues that are involved. To get us started simply in thinking about how the government is addressing these issues, and in particular to talk about a very recent executive order of the President instructing all agencies on how they are to deal with patent rights and other technology transfer issues. We are very pleased to have with us this morning Mr. Eugene McAllister, who is Special Assistant to the President and Executive Secretary of the Economic Policy Council at the White House. He has previously served as the Deputy Assistant Director for the Office of Policy Development at the White House, and prior to joining the Policy Development Office, he was with the Office of Management and Budget, where he worked on economic and budget issues. Jean? Thank you very much. I'm de delighted to be here th this morning on the second day of the conference among such a distinguished audience. My assignment this morning is to discuss the President's Executive Order 12591 titled Facilitating Access to Science and Technology. But I'd like to take the liberty to broaden that topic a bit by placing the executive order in a larger context, which is the President's belief that a strong and vibrant science enterprise is essential for a strong commercial enterprise, 
and that science is one of the foundations for a more prosperous economy and a better standard of living. The executive order is a part of a larger program designed to bring science and commerce closer for the benefit of all. Before I talk about the, some of the specifics the president, specific actions the president is taking, I would like to step back a bit and offer an observation. When I first heard about the recent breakthroughs in superconductivity, I guess it seemed a little like hearing about a rookie phenom, uh, an athlete, an entertainer, an artist, who burst upon the scene, making it all seem so easy, so obvious. Uh, however, in real life, these individuals typically have histories of hard and arduous uh, practices, disappointment and perseverance. They build upon the past through coaches, teachers, and agents. Well, that's what I'm coming to appreciate about superconductivity. Lost in much of the excitement about the unexpected and the newly anticipated is the fact that the recent breakthroughs are built upon decades of work in basic science, enabling technologies, and advances in materials. And that, of course, is the nature of progress and the story of America's excellence in science. It is difficult to predict where future breakthroughs in superconductivity will occur, and, and indeed other areas of science will occur. It is not hard to predict that whatever these future breakthroughs, wherever they occur, they will be a result of the hard work today and built upon the work we are doing today. As Paul Chu said earlier in the conference, quote, today is a continuation of yesterday. I think the steps the president is advocating in science and technology, science and commerce, ranging from the competitiveness initiative of last January to the executive order on facilitating access to science and technology to the superconductivity initiative he announced yesterday. They are like the early work in superconductivity. They will serve as the basis, the means, the catalyst for further progress for our science enterprise, our economy, and our society. Let me briefly describe the President's competitiveness initiative, which he unveiled last January. And there were six components to that. One was increasing investment in human intellectual capital. Our economic future will depend on a smarter workforce, a more adaptable workforce. Two is promoting the development of science and technology, and I'll discuss that in greater length in a few minutes. The third was better protecting intellectual property. Inventors need assurances that their ideas, their hours in the labs, have some value. Just as many of us insist that our homes and personal property are protected, the intellectual property of inventors and investors must be protected. Without such protection, inventors lose incentives, and we all lose. The fourth item on the competitiveness initiative was enacting essential legal and regulatory reforms, such as antitrust refinements that reflect the global nature of our economy. The fifth initiative, fifth element of the President's competitive initiative, competitiveness initiative was shaping the international economic environment through better economic co coordination, aggressively attacking unfair foreign trade practices, and promoting freer trade through a new GATT round and the, the FD, free trade agreement we're trying to negotiate with Canada. And the sixth element, an extremely important element, I might add, is eliminating the federal budget deficit. For those of you interested in some of the details of these 43 separate items in the competitiveness initiative, I'd be happy to share, share them with you. But let me turn to discuss some of the actions the President is taking to strengthen U.S. science, technology, and commerce. I think the steps the President is taking can be uh, lumped in four general categories. The first is investing in basic science, knowledge for knowledge sake. This will be the foundation for tomorrow's breakthroughs. And I might note that in times of a great deal of budget stringency, the President has consistently increased funding for basic research. For instance, the President is proposing to double NSS budget over the next five years. Between 1982 and 1987, real R&D spending increased 30 percent. Over the same period, R&D, federal funding for R&D at universities increased 20 percent. The second broad category of the President's science initiatives, I think, is promoting greater cooperation among government, industry, and academia. We want to encourage an interdisciplinary approach 
to the problems and opportunities of science. We want industry to help direct research into areas that have commercial applications. And we want to act the, as a catalyst, creating a more hospitable environment for cooperation. This is being accomplished through a number of channels, such as the engineering research centers, the science and technology centers the President is proposing to create, and the superconductivity research centers. The third element of the science and President's science and technology approach is opening up the federal research establishment. There's a lot of important science going on in federal laboratories, and we want, we want to make sure that it's being used fully, that it becomes part of our economic mainstream, just as federal labs have become part of our science mainstream. We want industry and academia to profit from the knowledge created in federal laboratories. The fourth element, I think the fourth general category of the science initiative, is better protecting intellectual property to strengthen the incentives to invest time and effort into a project. We should make sure that the rewards for investment are sufficient and certain. The President has directed that the administration develop a policy so that federal contractors own the rights to technical data generated with government funds. This gives contractors incentives to commercialize this research and to protect it. The President also recently initiated, it released an executive order which gives businesses greater opportunity to protect confidential information uh, submitted under the Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act. As part of the superconductivity initiative, the President is proposing legislation to protect government-generated technology from Freedom of Information Act requests that might diminish our competitiveness. With that overview, let me describe what is in Executive Order 12591, faci facilitating access to science and technology. But before I do, let me make a plea or an offer. I recently talked with some representatives of a consortium representing universities and business who were particularly involved in technology issues. And they told me that the word about the executive order is not getting out, that not many people understand it, uh, not many people know what's out there. Well, that indicates to me that the administration has to do a better job of explaining that, of, of promoting that executive order. I'll take a few minutes now to describe the executive order, but in a large auditorium like this with a lot of people, it's hard to get the details across. I would be delighted to talk with anyone afterwards about the executive order, and I'm sure that the other administration representatives, Bill Graham, Bruce Merrifield, Joe Salgado, and Jim Decker, would also be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> the President issued the executive order because like the superconductivity research of 15 years ago, it will serve as the foundation for research and ideas and inventions that make, may make Americans in the world a little, bit, a little better off in the future. When the President issued the executive order on April 10th, he made a short statement, part of which I'd like to quote. It is, it is important not only to ensure that we maintain American preeminence in generating new knowledge and know-how in advanced technologies, but also that we encourage the swiftest possible transfer of federal developed science and technology to the private sector. All the provisions of this executive order are designed to keep the United States on the leading edge of international competition. Let me also note, before I discuss in some of the details, that the President used this executive order to implement some of the provisions of the Technology Transfer Act of 1986 and give them added emphasis. Among the most important elements of the initiative are, one, that it gives federal laboratories a great deal of discretion and encouragement to do things like enter into cooperative R&D agreements with the private sector and universities, to patent, license, assign rights to inventions developed in government-owned and government-operated laboratories. Federal scientists will have incentives to be cognizant of the commercial applications of their work. It will also enc encourage federal laboratories to identify and encourage individuals who might act as conduits between federal labs and the private sector. In Britain, these individuals are known as ferrets. We hope that whatever they are called, they will act as intermediaries 
hopefully working with the science and federal laboratories and seeking out people in the commercial sector who could use them. In a sense, they will become science entrepreneurs. We are also asking federal laboratories to develop a uniform policy permitting federal contractors to own the rights that I described a few minutes ago. The executive order also directs the secretaries of agriculture, commerce, energy, HHS, and the administrator of NASA to select one or more of their labs to participate in a technology share program. Such labs would identify areas of research and technology with potential long-term competitiveness and enter into consortium with the private sector, universities, and business. The executive order also seeks to gain greater access to foreign science and technology. It directs the State Department to develop a recruitment policy that encourages scientists and engineers from other federal agencies, academia, and industry to apply for positions in our embassies abroad. It also asks the State Department, Commerce, the Commerce Department, and NSF to develop a central mechanism for disseminating science and technology information gathered abroad to make it available to our science enterprise. The executive order also sets up criteria for entering into science and technology agreements with other countries, making sure that they protect our intellectual property rights and they protect the investment of our scientists. The executive order also directs the Secretary of Defense to identify a list of DOD-funded technologies that would be useful to U.S. industry and universities and accelerate efforts to make these technologies available. And finally, the executive order directs all federal agencies to seek opportunities to establish science and technology centers to, to act as catalysts. Uh, I think this is a, a broad overview of both the executive order and the context in which the President has placed that executive order. Uh, let me turn, I'm, I know that uh, Dr. Postma will brief you on how some of the labs are filling, fulfilling this executive order. But I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you, and uh, if there are any questions about the executive order, I would be delighted, and I'm sure any other administration official would be delighted to discuss them with you. Thank you, Gene. Uh, as you say, there's a great deal more there that can possibly be covered in a few minutes, and I certainly urge all of you to familiarize yourselves with what is in that order. Uh, the agencies are certainly trying to do so. Our next speaker is Dr. Herman Postma, who is director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Postma has been director of that laboratory for the last 13 years. He is also vice president for management of the Martin Marietta Energy Systems, uh, which is operated at Oak Ridge, and this in, which operates Oak Ridge. And uh, this involves, besides the, op the operation of the laboratory, manufacturing, production engineering, and research and development. Dr. Postma is also commissioner of the Tennessee Higher Education Commission and trustee of Duke University. Uh, he has abundant experience in learning how to move technology out of the laboratories and how to work very closely with the university community and with industry in developing the effectiveness of federal technology and research. Herman? I'm going to talk about some workable mechanisms of technology transfer, things uh, that, say, are applicable from experience, things that are going on now. One of the titles of the conference is Challenges for the Future. I'm going to talk about the experiences and lessons from the present and where we can go from here. As Donna says, the uh, federal government spends lots of money. As Gene says, new laws now make things possible. What I'm going to talk about are, are some of the things that have actually happened, and, and you have to realize that what I'm talking about it will be at the knee of the curve. I think things are changing very, very fast with respect to federal laboratories and how they approach things, and that what you see is just the beginning. I am also going to emphasize collaboration. It is hard enough to 
transfer of technology within a corporation from the laboratory to the production floor keeping in mind all the engineering and marketing and everything else has to take place that is added to by some of the things that, that have been traditional and with respect to technology transfer in other areas and we have to try to eliminate those collaboration will certainly be key to that uh, to give at least some credibility uh, I'll talk about uh, one such collaboration. Uh, I might do that at the beginning because it involves superconductivity. The old kind, I guess, the low T sub C superconductors. And that is at Oak Ridge, we have three countries, Japan, Switzerland, and, and Germany, and three US companies, uh, General Dynamics, General Electric, and Westinghouse, participating in a very large coil experiment uh, that is funded by uh, at least the U.S. portion, by the fusion people at Par Department of Energy. Each of these coils I could stand in. Uh, they're arranged as a sort of half scale for a fusion reactor, operating at 8 Tesla and at 4.2 degrees Kelvin, and have been operating in that fashion and at that temperature since January 1986. So for the last 18 months, these have worked extraordinarily well, and we're about to complete those experiments. This collaboration of having multinational, multi-company, uh, essentially uh, many, many people involved has been certainly an experience in collaboration and I think sort of typifies the kinds of things that are going to have to be done if we're going to make progress in, in uh, high T sub C as well as practical applications. The first slide is, is sort of says what I'm going to say, which I already said. The next slide, please. I'm listing. Uh, the variety of methods that are necessary, and I, I realize now how difficult it might be to those in the back, so I'll have to say some of them. First of all, everybody knows you've got to formally communicate it. Places like this, conferences, awards that are given, referee journals, preprints, and I guess in this particular field, the Wall Street Journal has been the collecting mechanism, although now I see there are three newsletters that seem to be out, so probably that will replace the Wall Street Journal as the chief means of communicating what's going on. Then, of course, there's hands-on experience, individuals who collaborate, which is terribly effective. People that know each other get together and make things happen. Another thing that's happened is that there are a variety of user facilities, unique facilities that are created by, by the federal government, usually, that are now open to participation and use by a variety of people throughout the country. Uh, the Department of Energy has 200 such user facilities. Uh, and I think approximately 10% of those might have some application to high T sub C superconductors in terms of what they can measure, how they can measure it, and allow you to have a quick insight into things just by going to places where these facilities are. Of course, there's lots of visits. In fact, there are industry laboratory assignments that are possible, and I think NBS has probably led all the federal laboratories in getting industry involved in that, but currently the Department of Energy Energy actually funds about 20 scholarships, so to speak, from industry. And I'll give you some numbers in a few minutes. The next slide indicates some other measures which I'll call proactive. Subcontracts. One of the most effective ways is to get industry involved through subcontracting by making sure that these technologies get reduced to practice. Exclusive licensing, which is now possible due to some of the changes in, in the laws that Gene mentioned. The executive orders and memoranda and, and laws, uh, Stevenson Wider Act, Bert by Dole Bill. Working with Industrial Research Institute, again, another mechanism of, of making sure one has contact with industry. Variety of workshops. We now permit our staff to consult. Before the rules were such that staff could only consult in areas in which they did not know anything, because if they knew anything, it was derived from the government uh, funding and therefore. All monies made that way had to go back to the government, and that did not, as you probably realize, provide a lot of incentive. Uh, we now pay for inventions. Not only that, the inventors can share in the royalty stream. Again, those kinds of incentives are very important. We now can help spin-offs, directly help them get the kind of help that they need to succeed. Creation of innovation and incubation centers, the formation of consortia, which I think is one of the more growing areas, putting at laboratories gatekeepers, people who provide that kind of information or the ferrets uh, that, that, that exist to make sure people have the right contacts to get to the right place. Members from industry on a variety of boards that say what is important in terms of the kinds of work that ought to be done. 
still in keeping in our case with the DOE mission, but nonetheless very important to give that insight. And then, of course, a lot of places have local circumstances, particularly in some places you're able to convince your own legislature to support work. Uh, that's pretty difficult to do in those other areas. Uh, the next, I'm going to give some specifics just to show what's happened. And, and, and you'll forgive me for advertising for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I think it typifies the kinds of things that are going on, at least at the DOE laboratories. Uh, but it's one in which I had ready numbers, and it's something I can answer questions about. We have 13 user facilities at Oak Ridge, uh, two brand new ones. One is the High Temperature Materials Lab, which was just dedicated as ceramic uh, research laboratory, which certainly will have some importance to the high TC superconductors just because of the nature of those superconductors currently. Last year, we had 114 users of those particular facilities. We have 27,000 visitors a year. And if you look at the full-time equivalents, there are 600 people who are, on, who are at my laboratory representing 25% of the laboratory who don't belong to me. They, they're there as visitors to acquire knowledge, to participate, to collaborate. The industrial full-time equivalents have increased 40% in the last four years and represent about a third of the total guest full-time equivalents. Last year, in the area of ceramics alone, we had 800 visitors, and it consumed three man years of our time just to escort them around and talk to them about what we were doing. So there's a rather large effort going on. Industrial assignees are paid for by Department of Energy, uh, or for this current year. As I mentioned, DOE also has about 20 total. We've granted 12 exclusive licenses. Uh, I think six more will be signed in the next few weeks, and that has gone very rapidly. Exclusive licenses are very nice because that provides incentive for a company to take some of the things that are, that are invented at these laboratories and run with them. Consulting, 168 people consulted last year. And that's grown by something like 25% per year. Five spin-off companies occurred from Oak Ridge. I noticed that, that uh, last year, Argonne Laboratory had 10. Again, these are all increasing very fast. What happens is that people decide that they've done something well from the DOE mission and are given encouragement to spin off and create a new company. 40% of the guidance is provided by members of uh, our advisory committees who are from industry. We subcontract 90 million, that's not 1,000, that's million dollars per year to industry with some cost sharing, 20 million dollars per year to universities. We had 15 workshops to take the things that had come out and demonstrate how they work with a lot of people coming in, sometimes as many as 100, sometimes as few as 10. Innovation centers have been created in spin-offs last year were four. The number of increases in inventions are going up about 25 percent per year. The next slide indicates some more specifics. The development of consortia, that is, having the industry decide the kinds of things that they want, utilizing the facilities at these laboratories that are most applicable to that so that they can at least prototype and understand what is needed and then go out and build their own thing. CAMDEC, which is one in ceramics, it is an outgrowth of the heat engine work sponsored by uh, by Donna in the energy conservation. Six industries plus the resources at MIT, Rutgers, and University of Tennessee are being applied uh, to this. Uh, all the procedures with respect to antitrust, all the lawyers have been made happy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point is that consortia can be developed. It's an essential way, in my view, to go and it directly addresses the needs of industry and provides these unique facilities as part of the government's contribution to make sure that they work. The steel initiative was started a couple years ago with three labs plus the steel industry participating. That's starting to get off the ground now. Measurements and sensors are nine industries in the University of Tennessee uh, that, are, that are being done currently and have been for about the last two years in, in the Oak Ridge area. Semitech, which is a recently formed semiconductor industry, is now has its own consortia and is exploring with three labs the possibility of using very special facilities so that they don't have to build them, but can take the results and then run with those. There have been recent successes in technology transfer, in which we have licenses in nickel aluminide, whisker-reinforced alumina, iron-implanted hip joints, 
ethanol production have been very, very exciting. So these are very practical things, and I think they fortify the things that those impressions that some of you may have had about laboratories and what they did or how they did them are, are, should be changed to see that these things are happening and are possible and I think are increasing rapidly. Some areas, next slide, please. Shows that I left out a lot, and I apologize. I think the NASA labs have led the way in many areas that uh, NBS has certainly uh, involved industry in very crucial ways for, very, for decades. I haven't really talked about the university efforts. Uh, many of the things that we're doing were, were first initiated by universities, and, and we've taken the best ideas that we can find and apply them for our circumstances. And I've not even talked about the Federal Laboratory Consortium which has received a new life recently in legislation and therefore acts as a, as a mechanism to acquaint people with the capabilities of all the federal laboratories and to make sure these mechanisms do get implemented. Now, all is not perfect, and the, the last slide shows that. Uh, and it's, it's a rather m modest statement, as a matter of fact. A lot of things need improvement. As I say, I think we're on the knee of this S-curve that always exists, not on the upper knee, the bottom bend. Uh, Expedited approval of patents and waivers is certainly necessary. Uh, the formation of consortia and the realization of what antitrust means has, has to be swept out of our traditional thinking and, and, and make people realize how much easier it has become. Uh, lawyers are always a problem. The, the impeding, I hate to say this, you're probably a lawyer. No, you're not a lawyer. <laughs> Donna is. I, and the reason there's a, the executive orders come out, and the memoranda come out, and the agency issues things, and the, the Congress passes laws, but it takes a very long time for the, the lawyers that are in the business to uh, change their attitudes and traditions about certain aspects, because they're the ones who run in trouble. You know, and if they make a mistake in allowing something to be transferred, to one place versus another, and it goes into this congressman's district rather than that congressman's district, then you get all kinds of problems. Uh, that's changing. Uh, I think I could, 10 years from now, uh, if I put some areas that needed improvement, I'd probably still have that one up there, if nothing else. And finally, reaching small firms. It has been relatively easy compared, but certainly not simple, to reach the large firms, the, the, the top uh, firms in the country, those who do 80% of the research or those who have the most R&D dollars, et cetera. But a lot of innovations occur throughout the country in the small firms. How to reach them in some organized, systematic way to make sure that they have similar access, that they are acquainted with the things that are going on is, is a very difficult problem, and I don't think we've addressed that broadly in the way that we should. Uh, conferences such as this may certainly help. But I think these are some areas that I view as needs improvement. The message is a lot of things have changed for the better. Things are happening at an ever-increasing pace. I think the numbers I gave uh, are only representative. There are certainly places and examples that have done much better in some categories than, than what I've demonstrated. And, and for that, I apologize to them and my parochialism. But I do think what we represent now is a collective force that is moving in tune or perhaps even leading the game in a number of areas and I hope those of you who, who have the need take advantage of that because only through collaboration, only through working together as I think the President's message by the industry, the universities and the laboratories and the government broadly are we going to make the kind of progress that we must make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. I'll probably get drummed out of the Bar Association for saying this, but I agree with what you say about the lawyers. 
sometimes uh, if you actually made them happy in forming your consortia, I congratulate you. I usually end up with just telling them they're going to have to be a little bit unhappy because we're going to get on with it. Uh, I think Herman's message is clear and exactly to the point. Uh, the president has done his job by giving the agencies their direction in how we are to proceed. Uh, the job is really ours now to implement that and with your cooperation in industry, uh, those of you who are from industry, for you to tell us what you need and if other further policy changes are going to be necessary. Uh, we have a, a big job ahead of us, not only to make available information that is already in the laboratories, but to be sure that the ongoing work is expeditiously moved out into industry. So I thank both of you gentlemen for coming today to help us uh, lay the groundwork for that and outline the way in which we hope to be able to proceed. Are we ready? Thank you very much. We are very, very fortunate to be able to end our general sessions this morning with an address from the Secretary of Energy, whom I'm sure you already know has been a very, very considerable force behind getting this con conference organized. We are also uh, delighted to have today to introduce the Secretary, the Under Secretary of Energy. I'm sure you're all completely dazzled by all of these titles, probably wondering what they mean. Uh, I'm an assistant secretary, which means I'm at the bottom of the heap. I, I work for the undersecretary, uh, and there are not very many of those in Washington. Um, and he, of course, works for the secretary. So now you're, you understand the entire hierarchy. I won't confuse you by telling you that there are also deputy assistant secretaries, deputy secretaries, assistant undersecretaries, and other such things. I, uh, I had some good, funny stories to tell you about Joe in, in my introduction of him, but in view of the fact that this is budget week at the department and he has some important decisions to make in the next couple of days, I decided to play it straight. Uh, Joe has been the Undersecretary of Energy since 1985. Before that, he was Associate Director of the Office of Presidential Personnel at the White House, which means that he was responsible for uh, selecting and recommending, uh, helping to recommend those people whom the president would nominate uh, as his success, as his uh, um, appointees in the various agencies. Very important position which he handled with great uh, aplomb. By the way, in that position, he worked for John Harrington, who was at that time the director of presidential personnel. Joe has been a constant support of those of us who've been organizing this conference. We've benefited greatly, greatly from his advice and his encouragement, and especially his willingness to step in and help clear away obst obstacles and keep uh, decisions moving. As you can imagine, coordinating a conference of this size among the White House and several federal agencies, each with its own understandable concerns, and doing it in the space of less than four months has been a formidable task. And I can assure you that it would not have been accomplished uh, as it was without Joe's help. He has been a major factor in making it work. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Joseph Salgado, the Undersecretary of Energy. Thank you. I thought she was going to go on forever. Um, First of all, I would like to welcome all of you to this conference in your second day. My personal welcome to you. We're very pleased to have you here in Washington, D.C. It's going to be a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Secretary Harrington. I'd like to make a few personal comments before I introduce him. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan was elected President of the United States, he brought to Washington men and women who shared his philosophy of America the belief in the role of the federal government, how it interacts with the states, fiscal constraint, and concerns about deficit spending in the future of America. And he also brought the men and women that shared his same vision and his hope for the future of America and where America was going to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. John Harrington has served President Reagan in the White House as his assistant, Department of Defense, and now as the Secretary of Energy. Secretary Harrington brought to the Department of Energy a belief and a commitment, a belief that America's greatness 
its leadership in the world and the international community, a belief that its economic strength was intertwined with America's scientific excellence and its need for research. He had the firm belief that America cannot, should not, and will not become a second-rate scientific power in the world. He believed that America needs and must maintain the cutting edge of technology to ensure our leadership throughout the entire world community. He has brought these beliefs and a commitment to ensure that that belief maintains a reality to the Department of Energy. And a brief case in point, it was approximately a year ago that the Department went through an internal turmoil on a crucial decision dealing with basic research, the SSC, Superconducting Super Collider, a four to a six billion dollar project, high energy physics. On one hand, Graham Rudman, deficit spending, need to keep the federal deficit down. On the other hand, high energy physics need to move forward to maintain that cutting edge of technology to ensure the leadership in this area of scientific endeavor. It was a difficult decision to make internally within the department. The secretary decided to go forward, committed and believing that the SSC was good for America, that was needed for America's future, that was important for America's future. He took that decision internally within the department and with the aid of Bill Graham, went forward to the president through a series of cabinet meetings, dispelling disbelief, not only in its merit, but in its cost factors, convinced the president to move forward with a bold decision, a visionary decision to go forward for the SSC, a commitment to America's scientific excellence. It is my firm belief that the legacy that Secretary Harrington and the Ronald Reagan administration will leave behind is a commitment to scientific excellence, that we will ensure America's scientific excellence, the cutting edge of technology, through the next decades and into the decades of the future. So that not only your children, but your grandchildren will be able to enjoy the fruits of your labors and the labors of other people involved in scientific research. It's not only it's a pleasure, but it's an honor to introduce to you Secretary John S. Harrington. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if this light works. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's dark up here. I told Secretary Salgado that I didn't know uh, how I would do this morning because we had just left the memorial service for um, Mac Baldridge at the National Cathedral at 10 o'clock, and the President delivered the eulogy, and it was a very impressive ceremony. Mac was one of the people that I admire because of his uh, belief in the competitiveness of this country. And I think as we move forward, not only with this conference, but in the future of this country, he's a man that we would all do well to remember on his goals. An outstanding American, and one that I certainly will uh, remember always. And in that regard, I want to thank the people from the Department of Commerce that have helped make this uh, possible, National Bureau of Standards, United States Trade Representative, especially Dr. Bill Graham in the Office of Science and Technology, the Defense Department people, and especially the Department of Energy officials that have uh, been so essential in this particular area. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you today. And it's, it is very gratifying to see so many people dedicated to a common cause, and that cause is unlocking the promise of superconductivity and the challenge of making it a technological reality for the United States. It is particularly a great pleasure to meet so many of you whose painstaking efforts in the laboratory these many years has sparked the dramatic progress of this past year and made this conference not only an imperative for the U.S. government, but a first for the U.S. government. It is very clear that we are embarking on a unique undertaking, but it is with good reason. The opportunity that is before us is great, and the challenges are many. We stand at a threshold of a new revolution in science that has enormous implications for American technological leadership. 
In the words of our colleague Frank Press, superconductivity has become the test case of whether the United States has a technical future. There can be no doubt about the American tradition of ingenuity, the commitment of our researchers, and the seemingly limitless potential for applications of superconductivity. We have led the world in technological innovation time and time again. Through our universities, our national laboratories, the inventiveness of our private industry. We in the United States have everything we need to get this job done. What is in question is whether the United States will continue to be the world leader in superconductivity both in the laboratory and in the marketplace. This is an enormous challenge. The breakthroughs that have been achieved in the past year have given us, and I might say the rest of the world, an opportunity to leap ahead in a technological revolution. Together, we must commit ourselves to ensuring that America's place in the future of superconductivity will be that of a continued economic opportunity and world leadership role, rather than a loss of opportunity. The starting point of this will be a recognition that the marketplace of the 1980s and the 1990s is increasingly international and competitive. Instantaneous communications, multinational corporation, widespread computer technology, and the interrelationship of financial markets are facts of life. You heard the President talk about those yesterday. In this new age of global trade and keen competitiveness, we must make certain that we can meet and better the competition, not only in the laboratory, but in the marketplace. Winning medals, winning prizes for our scientific research is some consolation, but it isn't enough. The fact is the work has just begun. We know the problems. One, critical currents that are too low. Two, materials that are too brittle. Three, superconductive temperatures that are still too low for many commercial applications in the laboratory. Four, the inclination to forego long-term advantages for short-term profits in the market. These are some of them. Despite these problems, with progress we've seen over the past year, we are rightfully optimistic and we have grounds for great hope and optimism. Now, the President's participation in this conference yesterday underscores his leadership, his commitment, and his support, which this administration is providing to help our nation meet these many challenges. The federal government has a long history and an important role in the advancement of American science and American technology. We remain dedicated to this cause and to a fostering of nationwide research where the environment and where innovation and competition can all occur simultaneously. We are committed to supporting our outstanding researchers throughout this country in all disciplines, giving them the freedom and the flexibility to experiment. The United States has had a strong tradition of support for basic research in superconductivity through our national laboratories and universities under the direction of the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. We are proud to have played a role and a part in these recent discoveries. Along with the Department of Energy, other federal agencies have been quick to respond to new breakthroughs by redirecting available funds and staff to explore the fundamental properties of new materials and by increasing the budgets for fiscal year 1988. We have also moved to minimize overlapping research and to ensure that information is shared quickly in a field which changes daily. Major initiatives are underway at our national laboratories to improve communication. A national newsletter at the Ames Laboratory and a national electronic database on superconductivity to coordinate the flow of information among researchers at our federal, our university, and our industrial labs. We have representatives here today from Argonne, Lawrence, Berkeley, Ames, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information in Oak Ridge, you've seen their demonstration next door, and other government-wide agencies. I salute them for the efforts that they have made, the dedication, the hard work on behalf of these objectives. We believe that we can pay, play a pivotal coordinating role between all sectors of science and technology, and we will continue to seek these new partnerships 
between our universities, our federal laboratories, and our industries. Now, many of you have had a lot of business with the federal government before. This is a federal government in Washington, D.C., where it is noted that sound travels faster than light. This is a federal government in the past that has had long-range planning of approximately three to five minutes. We've all been involved in these kind of things. I have as Secretary of Energy and as a businessman before I took over this particular job. I remember too well the story of the town that decided in the interest of safety they were going to raise all their street signs that were seven feet tall to nine feet tall. And they were looking at how much it was going to cost them. Now, the federal government came along with a program to pay for all of it. And it was quite an undertaking. Their solution was to lower the streets by two feet. <laughs> Somehow together with the federal-state partnerships, the federal-private partnerships, laboratories with the private sector, we've got to figure a different way. We have to learn the lesson of uh, Mother Mouse. I don't know how many remember that story. The Mother Mouse was taking her mice around the house one day, showing them the ropes, and uh, they rounded a corner in the kitchen, and there stood the family cat. Now, the Mother Mouse was innovative, and she immediately started barking like a German shepherd. And of course, the cat turned and ran. And she turned to her children, and she said, now, children, do you see the importance of knowing another language? We need that kind of a solution. <laughs> In addition to its traditional support for basic research, this administration is determined to start to lay the foundation so that commercialization can occur. Last April, the President announced an executive order that would speed access to science and technology. It was designed so that federal agencies and laboratories could facilitate the broadening of our technology base by moving new knowledge from the research laboratory into the development of new products and processes. This has particular importance for superconductivity and for other technologies which may be significant to long-term national economic competitiveness. Bridging the gap between the laboratory and the marketplace is going to be the essential ingredient for successful competition. We need to explore ways for cooperative research and to encourage the collaboration at all levels, particularly with small business. We want to make outstanding facilities like our national laboratories available for use. Already, for example, a major user facility such as the National Synchrotron Light Source is being used 40% by the private industry, 40% by university communities, and 20% by the Department of Energy. That is the type of thing we would like to see. Now, cooperative research and development agreements between public and private sector are going to raise new issues concerning the ownership of intellectual property. And once that is resolved, we need to make sure that the patent process is up to speed for providing accelerated treatment for this fast-moving technology. We are currently working with the Commerce Department patent department on this particular area and then getting good cooperation. Other issues will arise concerning cooperative work among companies and private industry and how they will fit into current antitrust laws. We are making some progress in this area. You remember last year the National Cooperative Research Act of 1984, which liberalized the rules concerning joint ventures, which are reported to the Justice Department. The administration has submitted to Congress additional legislative proposals for antitrust reforms which would improve our economic efficiency. I've discussed this matter with the Attorney General Ed Meese, and I expect full cooperation from the Justice Department. It has been promised. The federal government is also looking at every option for removing impediments to the successful development and commercialization of technologies which are of great economic importance to the country. And in this area, we will need your help. If you have ideas, they need to be communicated. If there was ever a time when we needed the best environment for our private industry, the time is now. Competition has been one of America's most cherished principles, and today's global markets 
are putting it to a severe and, yes, a crucial test. We must have a coordinated national effort to develop the potential of superconductivity, but it should not be made by a government that decides what research and what development should be done and who should do it. Instead, our government should serve as a powerful catalyst for technological and economic progress, providing an environment for communication which can nurture the spirit of enterprise. Finally, we have not overlooked the quality of education in science and mathematics. Tomorrow's engineers are in elementary school today. The question that needs to be asked is this. Are they getting what they need to be leaders in the next generation of superconductivity research? The answer is clear. We can do a better job. The government should campaign for scientific literacy. It should include, among many items, internships at federal labs for promising students, and aid to schools on all levels to buy scientific equipment and computers. We need to take a hard look at our elementary and secondary studies. We need to attract more young people to careers in science and engineering. We must view excellence in science as a national trust on which our very future depends to help meet these goals. And to start this process, we have made efforts in the national laboratories to make sure the scientific expertise in the future is beginning in the Department of Energy. We've had an extensive program devoted to education. We had the best computer scientists in East State visit Livermore Laboratory uh, two years ago and work side by side with the scientists. Uh, it was a small pilot program, amazingly successful. They're all back working this summer as paid interns. Not only did the students get a lot out of working on the Cray computers, but the scientists themselves were inspired and reinvigorated working with these young people and their questions and their explanations. While this administration is moving forward on many fronts, and I, we have expanded this summer, by the way, that particular program uh, at five of our national laboratories, and we will expand it again next year. Hopefully we can make this program grow into a truly meaningful program. While we're expanding on many fronts, ultimately the challenge is going to be up to you. And I say this especially in these days of $250 million deficits, $2.5 trillion national debts. As President Reagan said in announcing his competitiveness initiative, we must act as individuals in a quest for excellence that will not be measured by new proposals or billions in new funding. Rather, it involves an expenditure of American know-how, spirit, and American grit. Corporations must do their part to take a long-range perspective in building an industry, striving for a balance between short-term profits and future development. As hard as it is, we must not wait until the technology has been perfected to assess the possibilities of commercialization. Even before the new breakthroughs, the superconductor industry was more than a $100 million business. Now, the ability to use liquid nitrogen for cooling, that's a substance, which at 22 cents a quart is cheaper than milk, offers many opportunities for cost-effective development. Recent advances in current carrying capacity are already paving the way for using superconductors in microelectric devices. Our corporations and entrepreneurs must be willing to invest with long-term success as their goal, rather than simply short-term profit. Our manufacturers must be willing to invest more to draw America's engineering expertise into the manufacturing and marketing process. The private sector must join in ensuring that there is sufficient support for basic research so that our scientists are free to follow their instincts in search of knowledge. Since we can never predict where the next breakthrough will occur or what unexpected benefits may come from even the most abstract fields like mathematics, it is essential to pursue the broad spectrum of research. I had the privilege of having dinner uh, side by side with uh, Paul Chu the other night, and he said after a lecture in Moscow, a Soviet scientist had come up to him and handed him a paper, and he, he was a little agitated. He said, we did the same thing you did. Here it is, 10 years ago. Paul said, yes, but you didn't test it for superconductivity below zero. He says, you must understand what you're looking at. 
Exactly. Our scientists must be free to pursue the technologies and the leads that they have. Our success in commercializing the new superconducting technology will surely depend on our ability to eliminate the barriers between basic and applied research. We cannot wait for all scientific questions to be answered before anticipating the needs of design and manufacturing. For a technology like superconductivity with so much potential to affect the American economy and the world economy, the process must be one. There cannot be a rigid separation by which industry waits for the results of new research and then proceeds. We haven't the time. Among other things, we must strive to improve the manufacturing and marketing end of that long process from lab to market. We must place much general emphasis on quality of product and systems engineering if we are to match our competitors. What we need is more integrated process where the end is in view from the beginning, where those doing the research have an appreciation and an anticipation for how their discoveries may be applied in manufacturing and marketing. What we need is more teamwork, more coordination between our researchers and our producers. Handling the new ceramic superconductors and using them in commercial products will require advanced expertise in processing and in fabrication, sophisticated plant design, and new engineering for the steps of manufacturing. These requirements are fundamental to developing a successful superconductivity industry and they must be incorporated into the overall strategy of materials research. It will do no good to perfect the new superconductors if we have not developed the capacity to produce them. It's a partnership. We want the partnership to be successful at all levels. There's a story about a partnership. The partners uh, in this small town were out fishing the same day and they rode out to the middle of the lake and they halted and they baited their hooks and they were waiting for the first fish to bite when one partner looked at the other and he said, Sam, we forgot to close and lock the door on the safe. So what, said Sam, we're both here, aren't we? <laughs> for too long, that kind of a partnership has been between the states and the federal, the federal and the private sector. That needs to change. Although we cannot underestimate the tremendous technical hurdles that must be overcome and the years of research that will be needed to engineer and manufacture these materials into usable forms, neither can we overlook the invaluable energy and other benefits which are going to accrue to all societies when we succeed. And that means we must be prepared to make a long-term commitment to bringing this and other important new technologies to maturity. Now, there are some who question whether America can meet this challenge. A few years ago, in fact, you couldn't open a newspaper without reading that America was losing its technological edge, or that the spirit of American innovation was following the route of the dinosaur to extinction. Well, those reports were wrong. The American spirit is alive and well. We are living in an age of innovation, and America is still the most fertile breeding ground for new ideas and new technologies in this world. And it happens because of our free and open society, the nature of our people. We have always prided ourselves on the pioneering spirit that built America. That spirit is the key to our future as well as to our past. We can lead the world into the 21st century, and those of you in this room are evidence that we have no intention of walking away from this challenge. Given the right market signals, the right mix of federal cooperation and the right regulatory climate, American industry has the competitive instincts and the indigenous strengths to take new technologies off the drawing boards and put them into commercial practice. I get tired of hearing the idea that America is a waning country and has no heroes. Those who claim that we do not have heroes in this country don't know where to look. I think that private citizens, entrepreneurs, are the forgotten heroes of America. Most of you contribute far more to this country than you get back and you rarely receive the recognition that you deserve. When they talk about the strength and character of America, they are talking about all the brave men and women who are not afraid to take risks and invest in the future to build this country. They are talking about you in this room. People such as yourselves have always been here as nation builders and community builders. From the beginning, it was Americans with big dreams 
who sparked the revolts against taxation, regulation, that led the fight for independence. They and future generations pushed back the frontier and developed our incredible land of plenty. When you stop to think about it, when we opened up the West, it was people who were willing to hitch up their wagon and start out across the prairies and bet the house and the farm and the family on the outcome. They didn't have an area redevelopment plan or an urban renewal. They just headed out and they said we'd make it. And always they were striving to create, to build, to succeed, and to excel. Sometimes they failed, but in America, you can pick yourself up and you can try again a little wiser than you were the first time. There's no question that we have the resources, the expertise, and the will to accomplish the task at hand if we commit ourselves to this challenge. Our country was born in an age of reason and science, and it flourished with our national talent for innovation. Our dreams of building a better life, a freer life, the progress we have made has been rapid and exciting. But as the President said yesterday, we can already envision the day when the 20th century may seem but a rough prototype for the 21st century. Superconductivity will help to take us there, and I hope we can make it happen. The race to commercialize superconductivity is on. The economic prizes wait the private sector, the country, the individuals who make the discoveries. We will face unprecedented international competition. Although we have to jump on our competitors in basic research, we must marshal all of our resources and tap our ingenuity to the fullest to compete effectively in this marketplace. Yesterday, you heard the President quote Benjamin Franklin. I thought that was interesting. I have my favorite Benjamin Franklin quote, and I'd like to close with it. Some, some years ago, there was a play. Some of you may have seen it. It was called Benjamin Franklin in Paris. And there was a final act where Franklin sits alone on the final stage, and he wonders what he would find after 200 years. And he says, I too should rise up and stand once more in Pennsylvania land and walk and talk and breathe the free air. For I know in my heart it will be free. I know it. I know it even now. What a dream. 200 years, and I wonder. I wonder how I should find them then, the Americans, to whom the name American will not be new? Will they love liberty, being given it outright in the crib for nothing? And will they know that if you are not free, you are not, sir, lost without hope? And will they who reap this harvest of ideas be willing to strive to preserve them as we so willingly strove to plant them? I think that is the challenge that we all face. This is new to us this conference, the government cooperation with the private sector on this level, the efforts to move us into productivity from basic research, moving from one of our strengths into one of our areas we are not so strong. It's new territory. We are unsure of ourselves. We move forward with hope and also with humility. To all of you who are involved in this particular challenge, I wish you luck. I want to do whatever I can to help this administration Department of Energy, and everyone who works for us work together hand in hand to solve this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I know I speak for everyone when we say that we are very greatly in your debt for the leadership that you have shown, and I'm sure will continue to show. Our last speaker this morning is Dr. William Graham, who I know needs no introduction to you, but he was gracious enough to introduce me at the beginning of this morning's session, and so I, I will now introduce him. He is now uh, serving as the science advisor to President Reagan, and he is also the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Dr. Graham previously served as the Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration as, and as Chairman of the Arms Control and Disarmament Administration. And it is his privilege and uh, responsibility now to tell us where we go from here. Bill? Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much, Donna. 
Before I speak to the issue of where we go from here, I'd like to thank some people. First, I'd like to thank the President for the inspiring address that he gave here yesterday. He's very interested in this subject, keeps asking me about it, and this was far from the only meeting we've had on it in recent weeks. Uh, I'd like to also thank the Secretary of Energy and the Department of Energy for their excellent overall work in co-hosting this conference, and special thanks to Assistant Secretary Fitzpatrick uh, for the work that she and her team have put in to make this a reality. I'd like to thank another member of the Cabinet as well, and that's Ambassador Clayton Yider, the U.S. Trade Representative, for his straight talk at lunch yesterday. Uh, and in memoriam, I'd like to thank Secretary of Commerce Mac Baldridge, whose spirit, if not his person, has been very much here for the last two days. I'd also like to thank the National Bureau of Standards, the Department of Defense, the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council of the National Academies of Science and Engineering for their co-sponsorship and assistance. And certainly thank our distinguished session chairman and speakers for organizing and delivering such excellent presentations. I'd also like to thank the professional societies and trade associations that worked on this conference. Uh, I'm sure you realize it because this conference, I suspect, interrupted a lot of summer plans that you had but this was conceived and put together in little less than three months. Uh, a conference of this size normally takes about a year, uh, and it, it hadn't been for the support of all these people, including the American Electronics Association, the Society of Automotive Engineers, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, the Industrial Research Institute, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Aerospace Industries Association, and the Electric Power Research Institute and several others for their support, this wouldn't have been possible. Perhaps up somewhat unusually in Washington, I'd like to thank the scientific and the public press who have done a lot to give these new discoveries in superconductivity the widespread recognition and understanding that they have today. I think they've done an excellent job. And finally, I'd like to thank my staff at OSTP for their commitment in making this conference a real possibility in spite of long, long days and longer weekends. Now, where do we go from here? To answer this question, I think it's useful to reflect over what we've heard in the last day and a half, to note the many applications and the great potential that high temperature superconductivity has for a whole host of applications that we can now see and I suspect a still larger set of applications that we have yet to imagine. Our scientists have responded to this exciting series of breakthroughs and developments uh, with real enthusiasm and dedication. Many in American corporate management and industry, to their credit, are also recognizing the potential of these materials and are redirecting their resources and restructuring their priorities. Our great diversity and flexibility in this country, both in the public area and in the private sector, are strengths that we have to bring into full, full uh, engagement in this process. We've got to use the freedom we have to respond to challenges. But the test of our resolve will be in our ability to move these technologies from the laboratory and into the marketplace, and our ability to have the endurance and the stamina to stay in the competition in the long run. So where do we go? Research in superconductivity and other advanced technologies is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. Universities are increasingly establishing interdisciplinary research centers. Some of these centers are local initiatives, and others come from local, state, federal government, and industrial cooperation such as the engineering research centers of the National Science Foundation or the material science center that they've also established, in fact, established some years ago. All these centers want strong industrial participation and have well-defined uh, ways to, uh, to connect with industry and, and encourage that participation. 
but it needs industry to come forward to understand what's going on in the centers and what their specialties are and to be willing to bring people, good people, into the university centers and to accept people from the universities into the industry on a, for enough period of time that they can really do things of substance. That's one thing you can do. You can find out what the interdisciplinary and other relevant work going on in your university community is and become a strong participant in it. Yesterday, the president announced four new superconductivity centers, three in the Department of Energy and one in the Department of Commerce's National Bureau of Standards. These uh, centers are being established with specific characteristics. First, they're to involve state-of-the-art research uh, in the field that the center is focusing on. Second, they're to stay aware and knowledgeable about worldwide activities in that field. Their horizon goes beyond their own center. Third, they're to have well-defined and accessible interfaces uh, with the private sector uh, and with others, with the university community. Certainly, industry should know where to interface with these centers and how to communicate with them. It should be communication channels, but it should also be people. People should move on a temporary basis into our uh, government lab research centers, and people from the government lab should be invited to move into industry. Uh, as you and I know, the best way and the fastest way, and in some cases the only way to transfer technology, is to have people carry it from one place to another. Work with these centers. Uh, find the government labs in the areas that you have expertise in or the areas that complement your expertise. As the President and Secretary Harrington have said, uh, we in government are strong supporters of U.S. industry, and we're working every day to change the idea that government's part of the problem and toward making government part of our solutions. You can help that with your ideas and your support for needed legislation, legislation to unencumber our industry so that it can move to its fullest potential. But most important, you can work together. You and industry can bring what you can do to the table and find other people and other companies who can complement that and who can strengthen your own assets. And you can start that this afternoon. The working groups that we have this afternoon <coughs> are going to be fora where you can talk to your colleagues, where you can talk to people in government, and, uh, talk to the panels. Let us know what you're thinking about. Let us know what you're doing. Let us know what you're looking for. And listen to what your colleagues say. And then keep that dialogue going. And every morning when you get up, Say to yourself that we're in a tough international competition, but we're in it together, and we're in it for the long run. Thank you very much. There are a couple of people that I'd like to recognize who never make it to the podium to be applauded. And without them, we could never have put this together. Uh, they are from the Department of Ener Energy, Anna Larkin on my staff, and Joel Snow on Jim Decker's staff, Ken Gordon from the National Bureau of Standards, Adrian DeGraff from NSF, Ted Burlingcourt from the Department of Defense,